In the New Testament, Jesus is supposed to be a real human being, although an unusual human being, because he only has one human parent and not two. God miraculously caused his mother to become pregnant with him, and for that reason, according to the Gospel of Luke, he's to be called the Son of God. And in first century Judaism, this title, Son of God, was given to the Messiah, God's anointed, this special agent sent by God who will restore the kingdom to Israel, who will usher in a new era of peace and prosperity. Jesus is taught clearly to be those things in all the New Testament. But now, how is Jesus related to God? After all, Jesus performs miracles, he forgives sins, he comes back to life after being killed. Is Jesus God himself? Is he God in disguise? Is he God in human form? How can the God of the Jewish Bible be a human being? Isn't any human being a creature? The God of the Jewish Bible is not supposed to have ever been created. He's the creator of everything else. A human being, typically, is very limited in knowledge and power, whereas the God of the Jewish Bible is unlimited in knowledge and unlimited in power. In the history of Christianity, there are broadly four ways of sorting all this out. There are four types of Christology. The first we've seen already, it's nowadays called docetic Christology. This is that Jesus appeared to be a man, but was really divine. He's really some sort of divine spirit which has come from a greater realm. This view is held by different Gnostic groups, but it's always been rejected by mainstream Christianity, and indeed it's taught against in the Gospels. A second approach can be called humanitarian Christology, that Jesus is really human, although miraculously conceived and born to a virgin, and is not divine, that is, not divine in the sense that the one true God, Yahweh, is divine. This type of view of Jesus was held by different groups within the first couple hundred years of Christianity, and again in early modern times, from the Reformation era onward, some Protestants called Unitarians and Socinians have held this type of view. And today you'll find this represented in various parts of the world and on the internet as Biblical Unitarianism. Note that these two views kind of neatly get rid of the problem of how one being can be both human and divine. The Setic Christology says he's not really human, and Humanitarian Christology says that he's not really divine. He can be described as divine in that he comes from God, is caused to exist by God, God is his father, and so on, but he doesn't have a divine nature. He's not omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, the unique creator, and so on. A third view we can call subordinationist Christology. This holds that Jesus has both a divine nature and a human nature, but is divine in a lesser sense than God is divine. Here we get into a theory about natures that there are such things as natures, that you have a nature, that God has a nature, and the theory is that one being could have both a human one and a divine one, though even though it has a divine nature, that doesn't make it a second monotheistic God. Jesus is still a lesser being than God. This was the view that really prevailed in mainstream Christianity between around the year 150 and about the year 350. On this type of view, Jesus hasn't eternally existed, or if he has eternally existed, still he's dependent upon God for his existence. This type of view is consistent with thinking that there have been times in Jesus' life when he was limited in power and in which he had limits to his knowledge. And the basic type of argument that was accepted starting in the mid to late 100s is that clearly Jesus manifests a divine nature and not just a human one. He does things only a being with a divine nature can do. These early Christian theologians in the 100s and 200s, for instance, they do refer to Jesus as our God or address him as God or call him a God. And yet when challenged about whether they're really monotheists, they emphasize the uniqueness of the Father. And they make the point that they agree with Judaism about who the one true God is. The most famous and important early Christian theologian, Origen or Origen, distinguishes the God from God. He says that Jesus is God, or a God, whereas the God, in English, capital G-O-D, he says, is the Father. But subordinationist Christology is not where the bulk of the Christian tradition settled. The fourth view is what we call Chalcedonian Christology. It's the teaching that Jesus was one person with both a divine nature and a human nature. After a series of controversies, this was expressed in a famous statement formulated by the Council of Chalcedon, or Chalcedon, in the year 451. The only problem with this, and well, some would say it's a problem and some would say it's a virtue of the document, is that it's unclear. 
it's unclear what it means. And it seems to present rules for speaking about Jesus rather than a coherent view about how to understand him, about how to think about him. This is the understanding of Jesus which has been endorsed, at least in theory, by all the largest branches of Christianity. And in this tradition, they say things like that Jesus is God, that he's God in the flesh, or God in human form. And they call Jesus the God-man. And what that means is that he has a divine nature and he has a human nature. In the next and last segment of this lecture, the Christian diagnosis and cure.